Hi everyone, welcome to Cyber Monday. Joining me as always is my very clever co-host, Mr. Dominic Vogel. <laughs> Dominic, who do we have in the hot seat today? One of these days you're gonna run out of adjectives <laughs> to describe me. Um, There's a brick wall at the end. Of <laughs> uh, today we have uh, Derek May. He's a technology and cyber specialist with Hub International. Uh, so he knows the uh, insurance world uh, really, really well. And I think we're gonna have a really interesting discussion because I don't think we've had someone of his uh, Never. background on our show. So yeah, that sounds be a lot of fun. Sounds awesome. So I'm gonna hop in this chair and invite Derek in here and we'll be right back. Derek, thank you so much for taking time of your busy day to chat with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Awesome to have you. So let's get right into it here. Let's frame some context about insurance, commercial insurance. When we're talking about dealing with risk transfer and yeah. this, uh, dealing with risk for a company, what are all the categories of insurance that a business needs to think about? Obviously, it's every business owner's favorite topic, right? Yeah. Insurance. <laughs> it's exciting. Uh, it's exciting <laughs> stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, everybody is is you know, used to paying for property insurance and right. general liability, which protects uh, for bodily injury and, and property damage to, um, to third parties. Right. Um, you, you know, sued. exactly. In some cases, uh, you know, professional firms are going to have what's called professional liability mm -hmm. um, for errors and emissions and things like that. So that's more of a financial loss. Mm -hmm. These coverages have been around for, you know, <laughs> Really, <laughs> hundreds of yeah, years. Longer than we've been around. Exactly. <laughs> if you're a professional, hopefully you at least know about that coverage. Exactly. We would hope that your broker has informed you of those basic coverages. Um, but what we've started to see is is new coverages like cyber um, mm -hmm. really take the market by storm. Um, it's something that obviously no one really had before. And so now the insurance companies are um, really scripting these policies to, to be as broad as possible um, and, and to be a good add-on for these companies uh, because we are seeing more risk uh, really in the cyber world than we are in, in the real world these days. So mm -hmm. well, that totally makes sense. So the way that we like to frame it is, okay, how does one approach cyber risk? So we'll just dive into that kind of one subset of risk, cyber, sure. yeah. uh, cyber risk. First thing we do, baseline the risk, assess the risk, then we want to reduce the risk. We yeah. want to put protections in place mm -hmm. and then there is less risk to insure. Yeah. So transferring the residual risk in the form of insurance. So I want to get into what the insurance covers, but what would you say are like the top one or two or three cyber risks today? Yeah, right now, um, and, and really going back a couple of years, the biggest risks that we've seen in the cyber world are ransomware, for sure. Um, yeah. That's number one. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is uh, social engineering type losses. So that's um, an instance where one of your employees is duped into doing something they really shouldn't be doing. Right. Uh, and and usually um, the the quickest and easiest way to monetize um, that uh, interaction with the employee um, is to get them to wire money to the mm -hmm. wrong people. Mm -hmm. And so often they'll be monitoring the emails going back and forth. Um, the hacker will jump in at an opportune time. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll send a, cha a change of banking details and then boom, that money is gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we really want to get our clients to be um, you know, picking up the phone, verifying those transactions. But um, between social engineering losses and cyber uh, cyber crime mm -hmm. um, and uh, the um, uh, the ransomware, yeah. Yeah. those are the two biggest areas that we're seeing claims hit these days. Yeah, there's not a doubt. So you've got it would be interesting to hear some claim stories. Mm -hmm. But uh, before we do that, let's talk about what is actually covered. Sure. So there are great cyber policies and there are some variations among different insurers and different wordings. What's yeah. covered, what's excluded. Typically, uh, what are the coverages? Yeah, so any good cyber policy is gonna have two sides to it. You're gonna have what's called third party um, liability coverage, mm -hmm. uh, as well as first party um, expense coverage. Okay. And so let's start first maybe on the third party side. This yeah. is um, fairly similar to what you would typically see on a general liability policy, right? You get sued uh, because something happened, um, mm -hmm. the policy is gonna pay for defense settlements and any potential awards. So you, you have a wet floor, somebody slips and falls, you were negligent and yeah. you get sued. And that would be the general liability. Right. Um, right. In the cyber world, that could be uh, one of three things. Mm -hmm. So um, a network security event where mm -hmm. say your servers get taken over by you know some sort of um, bad actor, mm -hmm. uh, they then use those servers to go after a third party. Um, if that third party suffers a financial loss uh, as a result of that hack, they could come and sue you for that. Mm -hmm. um, it could be just virus t transmission, denial of service attacks, things like that. Again, your servers or your information is, is compromised. It spreads that to third parties. Mm -hmm. They come back after you. Um, the second piece would be privacy liability, and this is yeah. the big one. We see mainly where lawsuits are triggered in the US. Mm -hmm. And this is 
um, a breach of sensitive information that you're holding, mm -hmm. um, which then gets into the hacker's hands. Mm -hmm. um, they put it on the dark web or you know whatever, whatever, and um, and you will ultimately have to notify those affected individuals. Mm -hmm. They get that letter in the mail. The, the next call is to their lawyer, and all you have a single or a class action lawsuit. Yeah, yeah. Um, the final thing that sort of sneaks into this policy is what's called media liability. And so if you have, uh, I mean, most businesses today would have a website or maybe a social media presence. Yeah. Um, if you accidentally use a, um, some infringing content, whether that be a picture, music, mm -hmm. um, a video, mm -hmm. um, a slogan, um, something of that nature, uh, again, and it infringes on a third party's intellectual property rights, if you get sued, mm -hmm. uh, you would have coverage for that. And believe it or not, we've seen that happen quite a, quite a bit where a company puts out that promotional YouTube video. Yeah. They put some music in the background yeah. mm -hmm. uh, to try to spice it up. Yeah. Well, they forget that that's owned by somebody else. And all of a sudden now you get a demand letter in the mail. Uh, they're going after the deep pockets. And we've seen claims uh, in six figures for that. Wow. So, yeah. Fun times. Wow. Yeah. So first party coverage. Exactly. So that's the third party. Um, the first party in Canada, that's where we see the bulk of the risk. So luckily, we're not as litigious as our neighbors <laughs> in the south. Um, so what we see a lot is is those first party um, coverages come into play. Mm -hmm. So once you experience that breach, you're going to notify the privacy commissioner. Uh, the privacy commissioner um, is going to deem whether it has breached that threshold of a real risk of significant harm, which is the legal definition as to whether you have to notify affected individuals or not. Mm -hmm. Um, if it does, you're going to have to send out a registered letter or an email um, to the affected individuals, let them know what happened. Um, you're going to want to set them up for credit monitoring services. Um, obviously, all of this is going to be done by professionals. So we're not just going to do it with our own team. We're going to bring in the, those specialists to help handle um, those specific incidents. Yep. Um, we're also probably going to bring in a forensic team to determine exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. How did the hackers get in? Did, the, did they exfiltrate any data? Mm -hmm. um, you know, are there still back doors in the system? Exactly, yeah. um, and that, really, the forensics in itself is the bulk of where the cost is going to lie. It's it sounds pretty robust, and I'm, yeah. I think about enterprises and the way that you're talking big companies. Mm -hmm. But have you have you found in your experience with your clients or otherwise that it's it's the big companies that are getting attacked, or is it? Uh, on, on it yeah, honestly, it's everybody. Um, I give the analogy that it's uh, these hackers are going down a street mm -hmm. and they're jiggling door handles. Mm -hmm. You know, oftentimes they're scanning the internet, they're looking for open ports, um, and if they find one, they're gonna go after that person today. Yeah. So it's not that they're specifically going after you, it's that yeah. they're going after everyone. everybody. Yeah. And you're just the unlucky one that let them in the front door. Mm -hmm. These guys are looking for the path of least resistance, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in most cases, right? Mm -hmm. And in often, uh, often they don't even know who they've compromised. Yeah. Um, they get in the door, they launch the ransomware, and they don't. They just know that somebody's been compromised. They don't know who has been compromised. Right, right. And so, again, using the professionals that come along with this policy, yeah. uh, they will be the ones that negotiate with the hackers, pay the ransom if necessary, yeah, sure. or hopefully will restore from backup and kick them out. Yeah. So if they if they have valuable information, the hackers aren't going, they're a big company or they're a small company necessarily in cases like that. Is it there and is the door open? Exactly. That's what that's the those? first way in. But what we always recommend is that, again, we're using the professionals and we would communicate with the hackers through yeah. a anonymous email address. Right. We would never have the CEO of Coca-Cola, for instance, mm. respond to that email. Right. Because right. now it's, hey, you've just got Coca-Cola and they might not have known that. Mm. Right. So now that ransom, which was 20,000, is now <laughs> you know, two In million. the millions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so, you know, there's a, a very distinct way of how we want to process these claims. Yeah. And again, um, um, that's why cyber is so great yeah. is you get all of that support service in a box yes. so it's basically you, you you buy the limit that you desire but you also get all these support services to um, surround you yeah. when stuff hits the fan mm -hmm. it's really interesting the the, the you know the notion of I'm curious on, on your thoughts here like are, are we seeing a greater rise in sort of professional cyber crime like would you say most of the sort of the bad actors and by bad actors, I'm not referring to Nicolas Cage, but he was the first when Derek, not that thought, when Derek right. said bad actor, I thought, oh yeah, Nick Cage. <laughs> um, but um, you know, are we, is there we're seeing a greater rise of, of sort of the, the bad professionals, or is there still a large contingency of amateurs? You know, and um, I, I know there's been parallels with the broader uh, kidnapping. Uh, you know how, how kidnapping evolved. When you go look back at that as a parallel, mm -hmm. um, it used to be very amateur driven, yeah. but then as sort of the victims, um, you know, sort of how things evolved with the victims and the kidnappers and the insurance industry, it became very clear that it was it, the insurance industry played an important role in getting rid of the amateurs. Yeah. And uh, when you go into areas where kidnapping is very you know, high risk, uh, 
up more often than not, the people come back safe yep. and sound. Yep. Are, are, do you think we'll get to that point with ransomware, with as we see more and more professionals and sort of that pushes out the amateurs? Yeah, I, I think uh, you make a really good point. The amateurs uh, don't always have the decryption key. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing is yeah. it could be some 16 year old that's uh, downloaded some toolkit off yeah. the internet and now they're spreading ransomware everywhere, yeah. but they don't really know the ins and outs of the software. They don't know what they're really handling. Right, right. And so the, the problem with those guys is that you pay the money, you don't get the decryption key right. and it actually hurts the business yes. of the hackers because yes. the hackers are there to mm -hmm. You know, to make sure that that transaction yeah. goes smoothly, because it's if it good customer service, exactly, <laughs> and, and that's why a lot of these people will have um, not necessarily one eight hundred call numbers, yeah. but they will have email addresses yeah. that you can contact yeah. to help you secure Bitcoin, mm -hmm. to walk you through the transaction. They yeah. want to make sure that your customer, the customer service was, yeah. you know, good. The transaction customer goes smoothly. experience, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, they get their money. They then go on and attack somebody else. Yeah. So it's it's definitely something that I think is moving in that direction. Interesting. Um, but with that, you're getting more and more sophistication. So we're seeing new strains of ransomware yeah. where they're getting in yeah. um, and they're in your system for eight months, a year. They're exfiltrating as much data as they can, yeah. and then as a send off, they're launching the ransomware, mm -hmm. and that's when people uh, are typically finding. Um, out that something's occurred. Yeah. And so not only are you having to pay potentially yeah. um, to get your data back, yeah. but you've now also lost all that information that they've been gathering over the last eight months. So, mm. you know, it, it's not as easy as just paying the money and everything no. goes back to normal. Right. You know, is that, does that happen every time? No, but um, but there are certain strains of ransomware that are kind of mm. headed that direction, which is a little bit scary. Interesting. Well, you, you mentioned, you know, they go off somewhere else, but logic would dictate that if they were able to get in before, They'll, they're going to have to do something in order for that not to be successful a second time. So mm -hmm. hopefully companies out there are learning a lesson and yeah. doing what they should have done in the first place, right? Yeah, and, and that's certainly where some of the cyber insurers mm -hmm. are helping to correct mm -hmm. you know, that, that behavior. So what will happen is if you experience a claim, whether you're insured or not, yep. and then you try to go either renew your coverage <laughs> or get coverage for the first time, <laughs> um, the first question that we always hear from the underwriters is, okay, one loss is not the biggest deal. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's not great, yeah. but it's not going to necessarily, you know, terminate you from getting coverage ever again. Yeah. We want to know what happened and how did you respond to it? Mm -hmm. And what and basically what have you done to mm -hmm. eliminate those things yeah. or reduce the risk of those things happening in the future? Right. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's where you guys would come in yeah. and, and to help um, those companies, you know, get back on the right foot. Yeah. yeah, we um, obviously prefer to get in even before it happens exactly, the first yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it's true. <laughs> and I mean, you, you bring up a good point is, uh, you know, the there's a wide range of underwriters out there in the insurance marketplace. Right. Mm -hmm. um, some will ask basically what your revenues are yeah. and what industry you're in, mm -hmm. and they will give you a cyber policy. And that's, you know, they, they've got... I, I don't know how to emotionally process that. Right. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. It's a big statement for me. The, yeah. their, their model is let's write as many companies as we can, yeah. and the losses of the few will be paid by the many. Right. right? Many premiums, yeah. Um, however, many other insurers have, you know, eight-page applications. They want to know what antivirus, what yeah. firewall, what disaster mm -hmm. response planning you have in place. Yeah. Um, they want to make sure that, you know, they're working with guys like yourself um, before they'll even grant the coverage. Right. Yeah. And so there's a wide discrepancy between different policies out there. And as a broker, um, no two policies are the same. So we would always show the full mm -hmm. gamut to our mm -hmm. clients, lay out the positives yes. and the negatives of each. Yes. Um, because it's not as simple as just lining up five and choosing the best price. Right. You do it that way, you're you're going to get burned. Yeah, yeah. that's 100. Yeah. percent And it's really interesting because you mentioned that the uh, earlier on. I mean, like the cyber insurance piece. That that is that's probably the most exciting thing that happened to the insurance industry. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, in, yes. in, in literally decades. Yeah. I thought a century. Centuries. And, yeah. yeah and, and, and you know, it's it's the baby. And I guess as with you know, if you look at it from a larger historical context, as more and more, I guess, statistical data around data breaches becomes more um, apparent. I guess uh, we'll we'll start to see, I guess, some stabilization, or uh, in terms of the broader um, uh, cyber insurance, because if you if you look at like earthquake or flood, and like they have the stats to that, like yeah. very accurate because they have huge historical data to go on. Mm -hmm. um, how much does that sort of that lack of historical data? hurt things right now? Is that a hindrance or is that just sort of the market evolving? Yeah, I, I think what the underwriters have seen is this massive opportunity. Yeah. And while other industry segments have been hurting, you know, because of wildfires and floods and yeah. other things, yeah. um, they see it as a really good way to win mm -hmm. market share, get mm -hmm. some premium on the books yeah. to maybe ho help offset some of those losses that they're seeing in other areas. Right, right. Um, but we're still only at what, maybe a 10, 20 
30% penetration rate yeah. for cyber insurance. So yeah. there's still a long way to go. Yeah. So I think for the near future, yeah. um, cyber insurance will cyber insurers will still be very aggressive yes. in pricing and yeah. providing limits. Yeah. Um, it'll take some sort of massive ransomware loss that affects you know millions of computers around yes. the world, yeah. kind of like the NotPetya or yeah. other type of examples. Yeah. Um, but in, on a much wider That's scale, yeah. I think to see a pullback. Yeah. I don't think we're there obviously yet, yeah. um, but I think you know it'll happen at some point. And then we'll revert back to the mean, right? Yes. So when I mentioned that there's insurers that are you know asking virtually no questions, yeah. um, again, that's a way to get market share pretty easily, especially with those small mom and pop shops because they might not have uh, ransomware, uh, yeah. sorry, they might not have um, uh, you know levels of encryption or yeah. Yeah. they might not have firewalls or whatever in place for their small retail shop yeah. um, so those people would normally just get kicked out so these these policies all are serving a purpose yeah, yeah. Uh, to help get those smaller people insured yeah. um, however at some point as the claims start to mount I yeah. would expect that we're going to start to see mandated you know requirements that they have right. to have certain protocols in place before they'll be insured mm -hmm. in, in terms of sectors which sectors do you see as, as being um, sort of rapid adopters of cyber insurance and you know conversely yeah. which sectors are lagging and not really showing any interest in yeah. cyber insurance uh, the the main one is technology so obviously I, I specialize in, yeah. in working with technology companies yeah. um, you know for you know, eight to ten years, uh, they've they've had it just alongside their professional liability. It's been bundled together as one package. So, um, this is nothing new for the, for that industry. They've right. had it for a long time. Yeah. Um, the coverages have sort of evolved, but for, for all intents and purposes, it's the same. Right. Um, the financial sector, the healthcare sector, um, those ones uh, are definitely seeing a rapid uh, uptake of the product um, for obvious reasons. Um, you know, if you lose financial data, yeah. it's going to breach that real risk of significant <laughs> yeah. harm threshold fairly yeah. easily. Yeah. Same with health data. There's obviously privacy laws yeah. around um, those uh, data points. Yeah. So it puts more emphasis on the client to ensure for those risks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, areas where we haven't seen as much of an uptake uh, would be maybe manufacturing, although they also have quite a big, say, business interruption risk. Sure. Yes. Um, but again, that's where you need a knowledgeable broker in there to diagnose exactly the different mm -hmm. um, risks for yep. each company because none are the none same. Are the same. Yeah. And that's sort of one of the, the issues that I have is that we will always get asked, well, Derek, my... Uh, um, my neighbor, you know, has three million of insurance, so I only want three million. And yet we go and we do a risk assessment yeah. and we do the benchmarking exercise yeah. and we find out, well, that person manufactures for, you know, constr you know the construction industry sure. or yeah. heavy machinery or something. Yeah. Well, this one does, you know, medical, yeah. you know, related <laughs> instruments or something yeah. like Life support that. support machine. Exactly. <laughs> and it's com com completely, totally different. <laughs> com completely different, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes, they're both manufacturers, but they manufacture they different the same things. Limits, yeah. and, and so having the same limits just does not equate. So we need to go in, diagnose what their business interruption uh, risk looks like. So if all their computers go down for an extended period of time, mm -hmm. can they still operate? Um, you know, how much private sensitive information, patient records, things like that yeah. they have on file. Yeah. Again, going to the difference of the two products. Mm -hmm. um, some might have access to that, some might not. Um, and that completely changes the risk. Mm -hmm. So. You know, doing this just level benchmarking against your peers um, doesn't always uh, mm -hmm. make sense. We really want to make sure we're doing a customized approach for everybody. Hundred yeah. percent. Which really starts to speak to a question we didn't even ask, which is pricing of cyber insurance and how does that work? Mm -hmm. Obviously, those are the, the big factors that go into it, right? Uh, certainly. Um, you know, we see pricing all over the place, mm -hmm. and and it also speaks to the product that you're getting for that price. Mm -hmm. So um, some, you know business owners may have seen these small bolt-on mm -hmm. packages added to a general liability policy or to a property policy, and they're giving them 25,000 limits mm -hmm. of cyber. Mm -hmm. um, it is by no means um, the end-all be-all when it comes to you know cyber products out there. It's a yeah. very small throw-in. Yeah. They often exclude ransomware, yeah. some of the major perils. Yeah. Um, they'll they'll price that at $100 or $50 or something. Sure. And the business owner goes, great, you know, we're done. Yeah. Check. Done here, yeah. Um, we never have to revisit this uh, ever again. Um, yet, then they experience a claim, yeah. and, and it's a ransomware, yeah. and then they go to the insurer and they say, oh, well, everything else is covered, but we don't cover ransomware, because that's the biggest risk out yeah. there. Yeah. And so then they find out they have no coverage, and then they distrust the insurance industry. Yeah. So we always try to get them onto a standalone package. Um, yeah. And the pricing does, again, vary widely between 
um, their revenues, um, the class of business that they're in, yeah. um, their risk exposure, what kind of risk mitigation are they doing on yes. the front end? Totally. Um, what are they implementing? Yeah. Um, do they have, like I said, encryption? Do they have disaster response plans? Yeah. All of that would be documented on the application. And then we, as brokers, would go out and sell that to the yeah. different underwriters. And um, <clears throat> Because we're still so new in this industry, yeah. you're going to have five different quotes. Yeah. One might be 20000 one might be 50000 because people are still all over the place with their disc, uh, risk appetites. Right, right. And so, again, it does um, you know, benefit you to be working with somebody that is going out mm -hmm. and knows the appropriate people in the industry, yeah. um, can help sell the risk appropriately, yeah. and, uh, and can bring the best terms and the best coverages right. uh, and packages those <clears throat> together. And the best claim service, I would imagine, too. Yeah, and, and you bring up a great, great point with claims because that's what the cyber policy is there to do is yeah. to pay claims and yeah. to respond to these cyber incidents. Yeah. Um, like I mentioned off the top, it's sort of a, a cyber disaster response in a box, Yes. right? Because you get the lawyer, you get the forensics, you get the call center, you get the yeah. PR, yeah. all of that. Um, and every cyber insurer is going to have a different panel of experts that they've mm -hmm. already pre-negotiated rates with. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but you might also have your own relationships with people, mm -hmm. um, again, like like yourself or, yeah. or other people that, um, that they have trust in, that they've yeah. already got a working relationship with. Yeah. And so again, you do have some ability to negotiate with the insurer to use your people. Right, right. Um, but it comes down to well what are they going to charge and all of those totally. things but yeah. um, but having all of those panels set up on the front end mm -hmm. uh, definitely makes things easier when stuff hits ready, the fan. ready to go <laughs> i want to ask one more question yeah. we're running out of time <laughs> um, you mentioned about negotiating that side of things for your own experts what about negotiating coverage so let's say for example you as a broker you're marketing their risks yeah. you're looking at the wordings are you able to let's say there's an exclusion you don't like, are you able to go in and um, negotiate that out and broaden the coverage for your clients based on rationale? Yeah, it's certainly we, we can. Um, the good news about cyber insurance is that there's very few exclusions. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically, were you hacked? Mm -hmm. If yes, you're covered. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, and so uh, as long as a senior executive didn't have any knowledge of it, uh, yeah. wasn't involved in right. it, yeah, um, yes. it w didn't happen outside of the policy period, yeah. um, things of that nature, you didn't lie on your application, yeah. mm -hmm. um, it's it's basically going to be covered. And sure. we've seen stats. Um, one particular cyber insurer that we are very close with uh, yeah. says that their payout ratio is 97%. Mm -hmm. If you were to equate that to um, other policies in the, in the industry, it's probably nowhere near really? as high of a payout ratio. So Wow. Rest assured for, for your clients, for other clients you know, mm -hmm. that are out there uh, thinking about cyber mm -hmm. and whether it's actually going to pay when mm -hmm. they need it, 97% yeah. yes. is a pretty good figure to rest your hat on. Yeah, and just to kind of close out here, so I've, I've seen lawsuits between insurers and you know, people doing cyber claims, companies doing cyber claims, and they're not paying for whatever reason because mm -hmm. of an exclusion. Yeah. If a claim goes sideways, how do you as their advocate and broker handle that? Yeah, I mean, that's where the relationships um, help, right? Mm -hmm. So um, using a specialist, using somebody who uh, works with these underwriters on a daily basis. Um, you know, some of these people are, uh, we're going out to dinner with my wife, you know, we're, we're, <laughs> yeah. we're friends, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and when you have a claim, when, when stuff is really going wrong, yeah. it's, it's good to be able to tap into your friends Absolutely. to help, right? Yeah. Um, and if, if you're just a generalist who doesn't know these people from, you know, their neighbor, yeah. um, it's going to be very hard for you to, you know, negotiate on your client's behalf. Yeah. So steer it in the right direction. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's where, you know, Hub, you know, being a big, a big firm certainly helps us. Yeah. Um, you know, th there's other brokers out there that also have good uh, size and yeah. leverage and relationships, yeah. but um, that's what we rely on at, at Hub to uh, make sure the claims go uh, the way we want them. Completely makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of the more fascinating conversations we've had, Derek. So thank you for thank you. coming in studio and absolutely crushing it. We really appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. Good to great. have you. Uh, Chris and I will be right back and uh, we'll wrap things up. Dominic, once again, another awesome episode. What were your thoughts? Uh, well, first off, I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation you and Derek were having. I, I, I kind of wish I had some popcorn because there was some good back and forth. There was a I was a little red. Really, <laughs> it was so so interesting, and, and I, I think for me, it, one of the things I I learned. And I'm I don't have an insurance background, so it was uh, there's a lot of good stuff that, that I took away from that. But 
I think for me, learning that you know, this is very much early days when it comes to cyber insurance. You know, there's mm -hmm. so much variety right now. It's going to, for me, I think as a somewhat of a bystander, seeing that evolve, just like how other insurance sort of portfolios evolved over time as well. It's going to mm -hmm. be very interesting to see how cyber insurance evolves. It really is. Yeah. And I'm wondering what the timeline is well, for all of these future <laughs> events. I was hoping to get Derek to go on record to be historically correct and say, <laughs> in five years. <laughs> This will all be different. <laughs> Nostradamus. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I think, you know, my main takeaway is you need a specialist. Yes. Not all insurance brokers understand cyber. No. Um, it's a it's an older generation, mm -hmm. smart generation, but cyber is a newer coverage. So yeah. it's good to have somebody like Derek advocating for you on this important Absolutely. Uh, coverage. Yeah. So thanks for watching. You can check out our other podcasts on conversationsthatmatter.tv. And we will see you next Monday.